Hi, my name is Max Brodheim, and today I'm going to talk to you about implementing file compression. So a brief overview of what my presentation is going to be. We're going to talk about what is file compression, different types, implementing Huffman, which is a very specific type of file compression, and then talking a little bit about decompression and some of the drawbacks. So a broad overview, what is file compression? It's pretty obvious. It makes a file on your computer take up less space, and it really makes our daily lives on computers possible. We are the way we interact with our computers would be impossible if we couldn't make the files we use smaller. Uh, and diving right in, there are two main types of file compression. There's lossy and lossless compression. So lossless compression means that the original file can be completely restored bit for bit after you decompress it. And in most practices, it ends up resulting in a slightly larger file size. And we'll be taking a much closer look at this later. As opposed to lossy compression, which eliminates non-essential information, and typically results in a smaller file size, but it can compound on itself and have some drawbacks. So as an example, this full stack logo here on the left is the original. If you compress it and then compress it and then compress it and then compress it over and over again, you start to lose a lot of information. Um, so I've got another example of images here. I'm going to blow them up on the next two slides, but it's generally more effective as far as file size is concerned. So you can eliminate a lot of the size of your file but it can't be decompressed, and there's a fairly noticeable difference. So the difference between these two slides is very, very obvious. One of them, these are both screen caps from YouTube. One of them is at 180p. One of them is compressed to 360. And you can tell, although you can see the same image, you lose a lot of information. And I couldn't take this image and turn it back into this one. Uh, so some lossy compression examples. MP3, MP4 are probably some of the most common. Uh, a track JPEG images as a form of lossy compression. It takes every 8x8 pixel block and combines it into eight single colors instead of 64. Uh, .mov, deja vu, and really most things end up implementing some form of lossy compression. As opposed to lossless compression, which is generally would be the ideal choice if you could actually pull it off. Um, there's no loss of quality. The most common examples for us as people who are in the computer science world is text documents, source code, compiled code. Uh, as I'm sure all of you have had the problem where you miscapitalized something or you were misspelled a string, can you imagine what would happen if you lost information in your text file? So much as one bit wrong could mean, even if it was just one character, your entire program would die. So you need to have completely perfect re-rendering of text. Fortunately, it's not always possible. So a great example is Avatar from 2009. The digital film reel uh, was 186 gigabytes. That was losslessly compressed as opposed to the iTunes version, lossily compressed is 7.1 gigabytes. It's a bit of an extreme example, but it gives a good reason for why you really, really need this stuff. Uh, and some really common examples of lossless compression, bzip2 has been around forever. Uh, most things that end in .zip use lossless compression. ALAC um, is Apple's lossless compression format. Um, Ebooks are lossless. Again, can you imagine what happened if you just missed a word? PNG and GIF files are both lossless, and again, lots and lots more. So which is better? Um, neither, really. They both have their drawbacks. And in practice, they're both used. So um, a great example would be MP3. An MP3 file is a way of compressing an audio file. And what it does is it first goes through a codec, which stands for uh, coder decoder. And it takes out all the sounds that are too high for us to hear, all the sounds that are too low for us to hear, sounds that are overlapping. It just takes out the quieter one. Lots of stuff that humans can't hear. And then it uses lossless compression on what's remaining. And although all the audio files listening will hate me for this, you generally can't tell the difference unless you're listening very, very carefully. But it cuts out a huge amount of the file size. So MP3 files can be a quarter of the size of, an un of a uh, raw file or an ALAC file. Uh, and the general rule is lossless where quality matters, lossy where size matters. And in the real world, size matters generally a whole lot more as far as files are concerned. So how does compression actually work? Well, I'm going to be talking about lossless compression mostly. And it generally is based off of two different ideas, run length and frequency-based encoding. Run length is most frequently used with images. And it either stores the difference between two elements of a file or between two files. So one example is uh, in a movie, you have lots of frames that are just images. Instead of storing every individual image, well, why don't we just encode the difference between one image and the next one and the one after that and the one after that? can actually save an enormous amount of file size. Or a more common one would be storing single runs of a color. So at the top of the screen is just beige, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for the width of the screen. So rather than say one pixel beige, one pixel beige, one pixel beige, one pixel beige, why don't I just say 6,000 beige pixels? 
and I set the width of the screen ahead of time, and that way this entire block here can be encoded in a fraction of the size. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on how to implement Huffman, which is a frequency-based encoding, where basically you take, you break up your file into elements, so be it characters or words, find a way to store them in a smaller form, and then you find some way of serializing at the beginning of your file and just do the opposite to uh, decompress it. Uh, so Huffman encoding is a very, very popular method for uh, compressing losslessly. Works best for characters, but it can be adapted to just about anything. Uh, works by bottom up. So for any of you who watch Silicon Valley, there's this whole discussion of top down, bottom up, middle out. Middle outs, that's more for TV than anything. Bottom up and top down, I'll explain briefly what the difference is uh, once we do an example. It's written by a master's student for a term paper. There are a lot of different sort of urban legends about how he wrote this and why, but it generally does come down to he was told to prove why something else was the best method, where a top-down approach was the best method, and then he proved his teacher wrong in a term paper by making this. This in 1951, it's still the gold standard for lossless compression, and it's based off of binary trees. So we're just going to jump right into an example. Take the string go, go, go first, and we are going to encode it. So first, let's look at what it would look like if we didn't encode it uh, in a compressed way. So we'd convert each character to ASCII, each ASCII character to binary. So G is 103, then the number 103 in binary. Do that for every character, and you have 104 bits. But we can make that a lot smaller with Huffman encoding. So first what we do is we count the frequency of every character. Then we make a tree for every character, where each character is the head of a tree. And each tree has an extra property added onto it, which is the frequency of every character inside of it. So for go, go, gophers, we can count up the frequencies and make their trees. And then what we do is we put all these into priority queue and start combining together the lowest weight trees, prioritizing untouched ones. So here we're going to combine the P and the R together into a weight of two tree with a P and an R. Now we're going to do S and H, the E and the space, because we're prioritizing the untouched two. Now the two and the two. Now the three and the three, the three and the four, the six and the seven. So now we have a complete tree. OK, now what? Well, we can use the root to node path of every character to find the optimal encoding for each one. So imagine starting at 13 to get to a character. Every time you go left, you add a 0. Every time you go right, you add a 1. So to get to G, we would go 0 and then 0 because we make two left turns. To get to O, we would say 0 and 1 because we made a left turn then a right turn. We can do this for all of them. So for example, S is right turn, right turn, left turn, left turn, 1, 1, 0, 0. Now we can, instead of using the ASCII character binary numbers to encode each character, we can just take our new encodings. So the original was 104 bits. We can now encode it in 37, which is a whole lot better. And decompressing isn't too difficult. Basically, this is a recursive process. You start at the beginning. You take the 0. If I go to 0 from 13, do I get something? No. All right, I add the next character, 0, 0. Oh, that gives me a G. Awesome. Then I can look at 0, nothing, 0, 1, that's an O, and so on and so forth until you end up with your completely decompressed string. But it's one problem. If I gave you just this string here and told you to decompress it, how would you do it? The answer is you can't. It's just not possible. Uh, instead, what you need to do is add to your file header the binary tree that you used to compress it in the first place. Now, some of you might be thinking, why don't we just encode the frequencies of each character at the beginning? And the reason is that kind of brushed over this, but you can construct this tree in lots and lots and lots of different ways. And the issue is that if you just give the frequencies, you might end up with a completely nonsense file. So this actually means that you have to add length to the file to a certain degree. So because go, go, gophers is so short and serializing the tree is not so short, if we were compressing this with Huffman, we'd probably end up with something longer than what we started with which means that you need to pay attention to file compression. There's always a cost-benefit analysis. Just because it's compressed doesn't mean it's smaller. Uh, so now decompression. Uh, I like to think of this as a lot of the time compression gone wrong, because this is generally where problems pop up with compression. Um, decompression takes a lot of time uh, compared to compression generally, especially with images and videos, and at least to some things that I'm sure all of you have dealt with before. So, Who's ever watched a video before and seen something like this before? Happens all the time, and it's, what's happening is actually very interesting. So when you're encoding, or when the uh, codec is encoding the video, it's saying, well, you know, a lot of pieces of this are the same. Rather than re-render it, I'll reuse it. So if you imagine as I'm moving my hand in front of you, imagine I'm on a screen. 
well, the center of my palm isn't going to move very much. So why not just, or isn't going to change very much. So why not just take my palm and just move it over a pixel each frame? Well, what happens is if you're decompressing too quickly or something goes wrong, you end up taking old patches, which are these little squares, and applying them to the new stuff. So you can see the outline of someone's head here from the next frame, but it's being overwritten by the old patches from the scene directly before. So that's what happens when you try and decompress a little bit too quickly. So there are a couple really key takeaways from this. The basics of file compression really aren't that complicated. Uh, Huffman encoding is easily doable. Um, the implementation is generally less than 50 lines of code for alphanumeric. Um, and if you, in whatever you're working on, need to compress a file, sometimes it can be nice to implement your own file compression so you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, as far as lossy versus lossless compression, neither is better than the other. They both have their use cases. Run-based and frequency bases, it's pretty much the same. It's very situationally dependent. And decompression is generally where your problem crops up. Uh, so there were a couple of great sources I reached out. The CS department at my college, Herbert William Smith, uh, were the people who taught me this in the first place, and I still remember it, so that's good. Uh, I got a lot of my graphics from the CS department at Duke. Uh, Wikipedia, I didn't put a specific article because it's Wikipedia. Just if you're interested in anything, you can find it's a great source. I'm sure you all know this. I don't need to repeat it. Uh, this document here is a very, very long and very complicated explanation of a ton of different file compression. Really, really interesting, but it's a kind of a daunting read. Uh, but if you're really into this stuff, go for it. This is a YouTube video from a PBS series, a crash course series on CS. And this is an amazing video. It's 26 minutes long, goes over a lot of this with a lot of uh, specific examples. And if you have any questions in your day to life for the people here or anybody who's watching, feel free to reach out to me. I really like this stuff. I know a lot about it and I'm happy to talk about it more. Thank you so much.